How are you all doing? Vertic Designs here and for this video we're going to do something a little bit more different. We'll be taking a look at how to build your own PC from scratch, a step-by-step -step guide showing you how to set it up and get it up and running. With that being said, as always there'll be links down below in the description so if you'd like to buy the same parts and follow along. Okay so here's what you'll need. You'll need a crosshead screwdriver, you want to get yourself a smaller version of a screwdriver. You want to get yourself a USB stick with at least eight gigabytes of storage space. And this is for the operating system of your choice. So I'll be using Windows 10. Along with this is the thermal paste. If you want to use your own thermal paste rather than the pre-applied one, there'll be links down below to the one that I use and the newer version. If you're going to use thermal paste, I would highly recommend getting yourself some thermal paste remover. This makes it so much easier to come off. And along with that, we have the surface purifier, just to give it that clean finish. You want to get yourself some good old toilet paper or kitchen roll. And then finally, some good old pliers. Now this one is optional, but it comes in handy if you ever have any awkward moments with the case itself. Before I build a computer, I always make sure that I have the operating system ready to go. So you want to either get yourself a USB stick, which is at least eight gigabytes of space, or you can use a disc. Go to the first link, which is the official Microsoft website, and you want to scroll down and click on the download tool now. Get yourself the download. Once you've got yourself the download, you want to go ahead and put in your USB or disk in your computer so you can start to create these setup files. Have a look where the USB is, right click on here, and then you want to go ahead and go to format, leave everything else as normal and start the quick format. Click OK. And you can close this down and get yourself the installation set up, which was this file right here. Double left click on here, click on yes. And then this window will pop up. And this can sometimes take quite a while for it to fully finish what you've started. Once the window pops up, you want to go ahead and have a look through the terms and conditions. Scroll all the way to the bottom, accept the terms. Once this pops up, you want to go ahead and click on the create installation media USB flash drive and go ahead and click on next. You want to have a look and make sure that this is correct. So it's Windows 10 English for the language and you want to select which operating system that you want to use. So we're going to use 64 bit and we're going to go ahead and click on next. You want to click on the one that will say USB flash drive. You then want to click on next. You want to select which USB you want to put it on. So it's going to be E and then click on next. And there we go. So like I said, this is the part where you can put your feet up, put on Netflix or YouTube because it will take quite a while. Once it's done processing, you can go ahead and click on finish. And there we go. As you can see, we have it right here and it is ready to go. So once you've installed Windows onto that USB, you want to go to the second link, which will take you to this web page right here. And you want to go to documents and go ahead and click on the download button for your preferred choice of language. Once you've got yourself the user manual, you want to have a look and see what the layout looks like. Okay, so let's begin. First thing you want to do is of course, you want to get the front panel and the back panel off the case. Most cases will have these screws at the back and you can either use your fingers or you can use a screwdriver if it's a little bit tighter than normal and you just want to loosen it up so there's the back one. And of course you want to take the front one off as well. Once you've done that, you want to go ahead and remove the DVD slot tray. So there'll be a front panel, which has a clipping mechanism. And all you have to do is just undo the sides and this will loosen it up and allow you to slot it out from the front. You can get yourself the DVD writer if you're going to install a DVD writer and then just slot it in to the case itself. You then want to get yourself the screws which look like this. These ones are specifically for the case itself. You'll know what they look like because they are rounded off and they'll have a little bit of a lip on the side bit. 
and they're quite small as well. So you just want to screw in the DVD writer, make sure you get all four sides. It's optional, you don't have to do all of them if you don't want to, but you just want to have it securely on. Next up, you want to get yourself the power supply screws and to tell the difference between these ones is that these ones are slightly bigger and they are hexagon shaped. So that is how you can tell the difference between the case one and the power supply one. So you just want to go ahead and make sure you securely screw in the power supply onto the case. You can then get yourself the case fans ready. So I'll be using the Corsair airflow fan. And of course you want to get yourself these screws that look like this. These ones are slightly longer and they are more rough on the edges. By default, these fans don't exactly have a screw hole that has already been created. So this is why it will be a little bit more tougher than normal. So you will need to give it a little bit more power. For the motherboard, I have chosen the Tomahawk MSI B45. It's a great budget ATX motherboard. And of course, you just want to get it out of the pack. And a great tip for this is that if you add the processor, the RAM and the cooler before you install the motherboard onto the case, it just makes life so much easier. So that is what we're going to do. And speaking of RAM, the one that I've chosen is the Corsair Vengeance RAM. This one is affordable and it has decent speeds of 3000 megahertz. And as always, it's always recommended to get them in either twos or fours, because if you only use one channel, it's not going to compete compared to two channels. Speaking of two channels, here is how to install the RAM. Now, just like I said before, referring back to the manual itself, it will tell you exactly which slots to slot them into. For this specific motherboard, they recommend that you slot it into DIMM A2 and DIMM B2. For the processor, you know I just had to go with the Ryzen 5 5600X. Originally, that was the one that I wanted, but I had issues with the delivery driver because all of a sudden there was like, hey yo, I'm about to dip and I get a email from Amazon saying that they have left the marketplace. So I never heard from them again and I had to settle down for the next one below this which was of course the 5600G. To install the processor you want to first of all lift the handle and this goes all the way up to 90 degrees pointing up. You then want to have a look see which corner the arrow is on the motherboard and you want to match it with the processor. Gently make sure that it's securely in then you can lower the handle back down to lock it into place. To keep the processor nice and cool, I have gone with the Be Quiet Rock 2. If you wanted to, you can stick with the stock cooler, but personally, you get way better results using a aftermarket cooler. It's just way better. And this one turned out to be really quiet, but really good at keeping the processor cool. This honestly even surprised me. I mean, for £33, you are definitely getting a high quality product. To mention that I were hitting really good low temperatures of about 25 degrees. This was on idle. I will admit though, installing the fan was definitely an experience because the first bracket goes in nice and easy. All you have to do is make sure that the fan is nicely sitting on top of the cooler. You get the bracket, you put the two hooks right at the top into the holes and then you can tilt the fan and get the bottom of the bracket to go underneath the fins of the cooler and then this raises it back up and then letting you lead it back down. So that was the first side, but when it came to the second side, this was a different story. I had to really wrestle with it because we can't exactly tilt the second side. So I ended up lifting the hooks onto the actual hole itself. It took a while. My first time, I will admit, but yeah, eventually I got it down. So that's all that matters. You then want to go back into the box and get yourself the AMD packet, which contains the bracket holders. You have the brace or the bridge, and of course the brackets, which hold the cooler into place. 
you want to first of all go ahead and remove the old one from the motherboard which is the black plastic bits just by unscrewing the screws and you want to get yourself the screw bracket holders and these look something like this now to tell the difference between these ones is one side is wider than the top side so you just want to stick the narrow side pointing up and you want to get yourself the screws and with the washers you want to put the washers through the screws once you've got them in you can then go ahead and start to put them into the bracket like this it will tell you exactly on the bracket which one is for am4 and am3 and it should look something like this so then you just want to load the bridge or the bracket onto the holders you want to screw them in You want to do the same thing for the other side as well. Now that the mounting brackets are on the motherboard, we're going to remove the plastic cover which protects the surface on the cooler. And as you can see, this is the pre-applied thermal paste. Now, since we're removing it, we're going to use the thermal paste remover first. You want to get yourself a few drops onto the thermal paste. Get yourself the toilet paper and you can start wiping it gently. Continue the same process until it is nice and clean. So just continue on, adding more drops, cleaning it up. Once all the thermal paste is gone, you then want to get yourself the second one, which is the surface purifier. And this, once again, just gives it a nice clean finish and removes any dirt or anything that has been left over. Now that the cooler is clean, we want to apply the thermal paste. One way that I like is the X method. Now in this video, I added just a little bit too much. So if you're going to use the same pattern, then use a little bit less than I did, or you can just stick with the easy P method where you create a blob the size of a P. You then want to get yourself the cooler with the brace in the middle, lower this down slowly, and you want to position it with the screw holes. Now for this, I had to take the fan off because it was awkward to screw it in. After that, you want to put the fan back on. You then want to connect your fan up to CPU sys. It will usually be at the top of your motherboard. This is for the CPU fan. Before you add the motherboard in, you want to have a look at your case and see where all the screw holes are because if you're using an ATX motherboard, it will usually have nine holes and you will have one sitting screw in the middle. This one just sits there and is used as a resting post for the motherboard. For the screw holders, you want to get yourself the long hexagon ones that look like this. And then the circle rounded ones to hold in the motherboard onto the case. If you're someone like me who rushes ahead, you'll find out that there is a special screw designed for the screw holders. I only found this out right near the end. So what I ended up doing is I ended up doing it my way, which was to screw the screw into the screw holder and then that into the screw slot for the case. So it's the very long winded way. I would honestly save yourself some time and just have a look in the pack. You'll find yourself the special screw and just use that. It'll be so much easier because I ended up having to use the pliers to hold down the screw holder and then unscrew the screw. You want to get yourself the faceplate for the motherboard and attach this onto the case. You then want to slowly load the motherboard down, match it with the screw holes, and of course, match it with the faceplate. Once the motherboard is in, you want to use the circle rounded screws to screw the motherboard in. Next up, we have the wireless card. So this is obviously if you don't want to use the cable and you want to have a wireless connection, you will definitely need a wireless card. The one that I chose was just a standard wireless card with Bluetooth. But if you wanted a higher speed one, then you're just going to be paying a little bit more towards better speeds. For the graphics card, I went with the 4 gig MSI GTX 1650. This little beast is great and is really good for if you're on a budget since this was only around 200 pound and that is a low-end but decent card. 
Now ladies and gentlemen, what would this video be without a satisfying sticker reveal? You want to unscrew the back case brackets for the graphics card to go in. You want to get yourself the graphics card and remove the safety guard. Before you lower the graphics card down, you want to release the PCIe lock on the motherboard. You can then align the graphics card with the slot and of course the case itself. Once you hear the click, you then want to screw in the graphics card onto the case. You want to do the same for the wireless card and remove the back bracket. Before we install the wireless card, we're going to plug in the Bluetooth cable. You then want to lower this down, same as last time, align it with the slot. Then you just want to screw this in. From here, you want to tuck in the Bluetooth cable and then plug it into the USB 2.0 on your motherboard. Once again, go back to the manual and it will tell you there where it is exactly. It will have one pin which is missing. You want to get yourself the wireless card antennas. Using the bottom bit, you want to screw them in finger tight and using the top bit to rotate them. You want to have a look at the manual again and see where all the fan slots are on your motherboard. So for me, fan 1 was near the cooler. We have system fan 2 near the bottom left, system fan 3 near the RAM at the top, system fan 4 near the bottom of the RAM. Once you've plugged in your fans, you want to move on to the other important cables, which will be these ones right here. Starting off with the first one is USB 3.0. This is the front panel USB. You also have USB 2.0 for the other port. You have HD audio for audio functionality. And then you have these ones right here for the button functionality. On 90% of the motherboards, it will usually be near the bottom. So as you can see, HD audio, front panel, USB 2.0 ports. You have the USB 3.0 and of course the SATA cable ports. Once again, you want to refer back to your manual, have a look, see where it is exactly and you want to place them in. So for me, it starts off with HD audio. You have the front panel buttons and the functionality. USB 2.0, you have the USB 3.0, and of course the SATA cables for the hard drives. Here's what power supply cables you'll need. Most of these are spares, so you will get quite a lot in the pack. First one is the 24 pin power cable. You want to get yourself the SATA cable for the hard drives and memory. You want to get yourself the CPU cable for your CPU. If you have any old fans, you can use the Molex one. So this will just power any old fans that you have in the case. And of course, these are the spares. Your graphics card may also need a PCIe cable. The great thing about a fully modular power supply is that you only use the cables you actually need. So it should look something like this. You have the SATA, you have the PCIe, CPU, and of course the other cables. You also want to make sure that you've plugged in the CPU cable into the motherboard. Most motherboards will have a eight pin port for the CPU cable. For the power cable, this one is really simple because it will usually be on the right side and it is pretty hard to miss because it's a 24 pin power cable port. And speaking of cables, you want to get this massive dong of noodles and then just sort it out. Now to save you all some time, I'm not going to bore you to death, so I've skipped that part. For the hard drive, most cases will come with a mounting bracket. So this will just make life so much easier because you don't have to screw it in. All you have to do is just put it in the mounting bracket and then just lift the sides up. And this will make the pins fall into the screw holes. As you can see, it's just so much easier. You want to also make sure that you plug in the SATA cable and the SATA power cable. You can then slide this in to the slot and then of course plug in the cables. Once you've done with the cable management, it should look something like this. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect. As long as most cables are hidden and tucked in at the back, you're pretty much good to go. So this is just gonna save you the time and the mess from having it all at the front and now get ready for the scariest moment of your life. And that is of course, powering on the computer for the very first time. By default, it'll boot up into the BIOS. In here, you want to go to advanced, go down to the overclock section, 
you want to scroll down to the DRAM frequency and you want to set this one to your actual RAM speed. By default, it's going to run at stock level. So then you want to exit out of here and save the changes. This will reboot your computer. Now that you've rebooted and your RAM is running at its best speed, we're going to go into the settings, go into the boot, and you want to go to the boot option one and set this one to USB hard drive. So you want to go ahead and plug in your USB with your operating system, set the second priority to the hard drive for the disk. And of course, the third one is going to be a DVD. This is optional, you don't have to do the last one. But once you've done that, go ahead and save the changes, boot your computer one more time. This will restart your computer and it will boot up into the setup itself. Once you've saved the changes, you will notice your computer will reboot and your screen will go off and on quite a few times until it gets into the setup itself. So in here, you just want to go ahead and select your language. So I'm going to be using English and the keyboard language itself as well, United Kingdom. Go ahead and click on next. You then want to click on install now. This may take a while. Once the screen pops up, you just want to go ahead and click on I don't have a product key. From here, you want to select which operating system you want. So mine's going to be Windows 10 Home. You want to go ahead and read the terms and conditions for the Microsoft and then accept it. Click on next. You want to click on custom install Windows only. So as you can see with the system reserved, I'm just going to delete this partition. This will set it to unallocated space. Same goes for the other one. You just want to either format it and then do a nice clean delete. This will just completely wipe it if there was anything onto it as well. And then click delete. And then this will just set it back to drive zero unallocated space. Go ahead and click on next. Now that you've done that, this will take a while. And once it's nearly done, you will see once again, your computer will restart quite a few times and it may take a while. You then want to finish up with the setup. So once again, set up your keyboard, go ahead and click on yes for whichever language. You can skip the secondary keyboard. Now here's a trick for the network. You want to click on, I don't have internet. Otherwise, it's going to install old bloatware. Once again, continue with limited setup and you want to give it a name for the PC name. You want to click on no for this one. You want to decline the Cortana. Set it to don't use speech recognition. You want to click on no for this one for the location. Find my device, no. Basic dialog or diagnostic. Click on no for that one. Click on no on this one as well. These are just unnecessary things you don't really need. Target advertising, once again, don't need it. And there we go. Now that Windows is done the setup, it will install and you'll have your regular desktop. So from here, once you've installed Windows, what you want to do is you want to go ahead and make sure that it is fully up to date. So if there's any updates, make sure you go ahead and download them because you want to keep it up to date. Once your Windows is fully up to date, you then want to go ahead and update all your drivers. So you want to download your wireless driver, your graphics driver, your audio driver, and you can do this by going to the other link, which is to the motherboard itself. And in here, if you go to the driver, you can select the Windows by going into here and then go ahead and download all of your drivers. And then finally, you just want to make sure that your graphics card is fully up to date. So if you're using a NVIDIA graphics card, it will be called GeForce Experience. And you want to make sure you've signed in and you've updated your graphics card. And that is pretty much it. That's how you build a computer, get it all set up. And I hope this video was helpful. If it was, give it a thumbs up. Let me know what you think of this video. And as always, I will see you all in the next one. Bye.